Greetings, fellow armchair imagineers. Tiki here. And take a while too. And welcome to the triumphant return of Tiki's universe. That's right, folks. After a couple months worth of hiatus and just kind of being lazy and not really getting, you know, getting on the schedule with certain things, we have returned. We are going to be back with Tiki's universe. It is the show where we recap and respond to everything in the world of modern animation i mean not every single show out there but a good majority of them jacob i mean a good i shouldn't even say majority i mean in my own words but we've got a good plethora <laughs> of content for you guys jacob we've got of course we're going to be starting with rick and morty which just had its season premiere a couple days ago uh ducktales is on is on the horizon at about a week and a half which is a show that we've been building up on the channel for over a year now uh, we just got a new Star vs. Forces of Evil, the first, what is it, Jacob, the first, like, eight episodes were dropped for Star vs. Forces of Evil on Comic-Con week. Basically. <laughs> so there's a lot to catch up on, folks, and we're going to be inducting the newest, besides Rick and Morty, I mean, Rick and Morty, this is a series that obviously we're kind of uh, jumping into after season, you know, in the new season, but it's still got two seasons, but... Uh, Jacob, we're going to be taking on a brand new show, which is Welcome to the Wayne, uh, the new show on Nickelodeon. Now, I think it's really important for the Tiki's Universe lineup to include a Nickelodeon show, because I think Nickelodeon is very much on the upswing, while Cartoon Network continues to kind of go on the downswing. Like, even Steven Universe can't really save Cartoon Network now because Steven Universe has kind of fallen off in terms of quality a little bit. Not saying Steven Universe is a bad show, just saying it's not really the amazing show it used to be like back in season three. So I definitely think Nickelodeon's on the upswing and Jacob and I, uh, we both agree that Welcome to the Wayne from the first five episodes we've seen has a lot of potential. So I definitely want to start covering that. But of course, since it just premiered and the show's got such a big following and Jacob and I, you know, you and I, we love the show. I mean, you're, I, I think it's fair to say I love the show a little bit more than you do because you're not all the way caught up with it. Probably. <laughs> okay, okay. But uh, alas, yes. Uh, I don't know, Jacob, I don't know why you stopped watching. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? I don't know. Yeah, for this one, uh, I mean, I had it done, I had it for a while, but I just, I guess like I got halfway through season two and I just stopped watching for some reason. I don't know. It just like I just I was like binging the episodes and just stopped for some reason. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't for a lack of interest. It was just kind of like one of those things when you binge watch something and then something else comes along and then you know other things occupy your attention. So you've got some catching up to do, Jacob. But of course, Rick and Morty. Uh, the thing I love about Rick and Morty. And this is, I believe this is the first adult cartoon that we're covering on Tiki's Universe. Is that right? I, I'm pretty sure it is. As far as I'm sure, I mean, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I don't know what you guys, what you, what you and Dragon have covered in the past. It's just Steven but Universe, and then the rest of it has been you. <laughs> well, well, then I guess this is the first adult All cartoon right. we've done. <laughs> Yeah, I just love the uh, the complex sci-fi ideas that Rick and Morty sets forth. That, to me, is like the basis for a lot of the best episodes. And to tell you the truth, season two, season three, episode two is kind of, uh, it kind of falls into the latter category of Rick and Morty episodes that I'm not a big fan of, and that being the parody episodes. Um, yeah, especially after, after the Rick Shank redemption, this episode kind of fell flat a bit. <laughs> I don't think it's a bad I mean, episode, I mean, I mean, but... And don't get me wrong in it. Don't get me wrong. That's had some very great moments and all, but I mean, Rick Shank Redemption, Redemption was a hell of a way to open the season. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, had a lot more humor, a lot more action, a lot more fucking dr drama. I mean, had just had a lot more of everything, <laughs> and a lot more like trippy sci-fi, you know, like Christopher Nolan meta stuff going on. <laughs> and a lot more Rick. Oh yeah, oh yeah, a lot more Rick. <laughs> so uh, more Rick. Not enough Rickness here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and like I, I think when the show does straight up parodies, it's when the show is at its weakest because I think the show kind of thrives on originality. So a lot of people really like the episode from season one, Anatomy Park, 
And I'm just kind of eh on that one. I, I don't know. It's it's not the best for me. I I, I believe uh, yeah. what for me it's what they do with the parodies and like just like a lot of other shows. It's like what they do with the parodies. I just think this show is it's got such a rich mythology and such a rich world building and a huge universe to explore that when you're literally just like, oh, okay, now we're gonna do the purge which I think is the worst episode of the series, like by a long stretch is the purge episode or in this case, like long. you have it because it's, season. yeah, it's, I think it's like season three episode, season two, episode nine, something like that. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's a very forgettable that. episode. I, I, that's, I, I didn't like that episode at all. And then here I mean, it's I like, remember, I remember anatomy park. I mean, I did like that one actually. I like it. I just, I, I'm kind of, you know, like I said, I just think the series, like, I think the series is at its strongest when it just gets into like these trippy, you know, super cool worlds that are just unlike anything we've ever seen. And well, and, and, and this is basically, hey, it's Mad Max. <laughs> yeah. Like, like three years after the fact with Fury Road almost. It's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This was one of the episodes that we saw in the season three trailer that I just wasn't looking forward to all that much. So I'm kind of glad that we got it out of the way early. Uh, like I said, not a bad episode. Let's talk about some of the positives here, Jacob. I think the episode. I did, uh, Go ahead. As far as, as far as originality goes, I do like that they did with Morty's arm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think Morty's arm is definitely the highlight of the episode for sure. <laughs> um, I, I was like. How it's basically its own character, and he's just like, you don't even know what's going on. Like, why did this? Why did it go? <laughs> why did it beat up that guy? Why did it go drown a guy in a bathtub? <laughs> well, I think you kind of got the general idea because you saw that one quick flashback. Like, oh hey, how's it family? How's it? How's it feel to see your whole family burned alive? <laughs> I'm gonna whip you. <laughs> oh yeah. So generally, um, this arm is like a, a a savage warrior that lost its family and is now out for vengeance. <laughs> well, yeah, I got that much. Just like a lot of it, just like like it's like okay, his arm is alive. Just roll with it. <laughs> and just the animation on the arm, I think, is fantastic. Especially, especially when Morty first gets the arm and he has he doesn't know how to control it. He's just like, oh jeez, oh jeez, don't come in here if you don't want to die. I'm sorry, I'm not controlling this. You know, <laughs> just the arm just ripping people apart. Uh, this show just has such a visceral way to showcase gore in kind of a creative sort of way. You know what I mean? It almost turns like gore a, into an art form almost. <laughs> with good that doesn't go overboard. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. It doesn't go overboard like other adult swim shows would in a situation like this. But you get just enough for it to almost kind of be like realistic. Like, ooh, God, like you could kind of feel the pain on it a little bit. You know what I mean? Like even Rick Shake Redemption didn't have a lot of gore in it. Then that had a massive body count. <laughs> right, right. Uh also just before we go any further, folks, of course we're doing season two, uh, season three, episode two, because Rick Shake Redemption aired, of course, Jacob, I'm sure you'll you'll remember this when <laughs> it was a big April Fool's joke and Samurai Jack, when we were covering Samurai Jack, was supposed to have aired in its place, but what alas was, well, I guess well, yeah, I forgot about that. Technically, that could count as our first adult cartoon. <laughs> Samurai Jack, actually, yeah, that's that's very true. Actually, good call on that. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like first four were to our children, we're children's are now facing them by with adults. So, well, more well more adult, I guess. This I mean, like I think swing. I think with. I think with Rick and Morty, this is definitely the first adult comedy we got because obviously Samurai Jack, that was like just a super artistic show where this is just straight up, you know, Rick and Morty's got, like I said, it's got great sci-fi ideas, but at the heart of it, it's a comedy. Oh, yeah. All right. So, yeah, the the Rick's, uh, the Morty arm subplot is absolutely the highlight for me. Um, and how, how it brings to light how Morty's actually feeling about the divorce when he was actually... And he's like trying to pass it, like, oh yeah, I'm fine. Like, <laughs> passing, passing it off on like Summer and Rick and all that. But like, when it out, it's like he was like suffering as well, like, as he's just trying to pass it off. And it manifested through, through his arm. It's, it's like a funny, sort of like touching, 
you know, it's like a touchy, you know, it's almost like a boy and his dog story in a way, you know what I mean? Which is weird boy, to say. <laughs> a boy and his freaking genocide arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which only this show could pull off something like that and have it actually work. And by the end of it, when Morty's like, you know, I'm going to miss you, Arm. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, man, they did have some good times together. You know, like Morty got out a lot of stress. They killed some folks. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. So what is this like a ghost? You're just going to disappear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, surprising amount of character development from Summer this episode. I feel like season three, we're definitely going to have more of a focus on Rick and Summer. That was something that was, that was something that was starting to come into focus in season two, but I think season three is going to be like, it's going to be like a main plot line. Yeah, it seems that way. I mean, she's, in my opinion, she's she was always underutilized. <laughs> I mean, like you, like I said, I think there's some season two episodes where she gets more of a focus, like as season two kind of goes on. No, what I like is I don't remember. I only got like got through half of the season. Yeah, season one, she but, was uh, definitely underutilized. And I, I noticed that in the beginning of season two, season two, but as it went on, like she began to become more like like go on Rick's Rick and Morty's adventures as well. <laughs> Right, right. And I like how at this point, like, she's like the cool yeah. grandkid. Yeah, and you can arguably say that now that, that, that like, she's also, like, sharing as much screen time as Morty here. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nowadays. I, I mean, at really, least in this episode, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Like, in this episode, she got as much, like, alone time as Morty did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. more. Uh, let me see. I think the I think the robot versions of Summer and Morty were hilarious, and that was actually a really cool plot line. For I wished that more of the episode was focused on it. The whole idea of you know like Rick just abandoning Summer and Morty in this apocalyptic wasteland because that's something that Rick's always kind of like flirted with and threatened <laughs> some, Summer like, and Morty like, with, but never actually gone through with. Like like. Like he always like saying, "I can replace it with like any thousands of your duplicates." <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I don't know. Like I thought, to tell you the truth, I thought it was a little bit of a wasted opportunity to see something like that go down. I I love when he, you know, he pour. He's it's in the middle of the car chase. Car chase. He uses the portal, and then there's a one guy who's like, "My body is chrome." Who goes with him through the portal? <laughs> and then he's like, like, and he's like, my get my blood is my get gas is my blood. It's like, nope, just regular, <laughs> nope, just regular blood. <laughs> <laughs> like Rick doesn't even care anymore. <laughs> so I guess uh, I don't know. Like, I I do kind of believe Rick when he says the only reason he went back for Summer and Morty is that retrieving them would be slightly more convenient than putting up the charade with the robots in front of Beth. <laughs> uh, that being said, I do like just kind of taking the breadcrumbs as we get them, Dragon, uh, the, Jacob, I'm sorry. Uh, I do think that at the end of the day, if Rick is, if Rick is loyal to anyone, I think it's Beth. Well, that's his daughter. So, I mean, I, I, th I think we've seen that throughout the series. Like I definitely, uh, I mean, Morty, you know, like Morty and Rick obviously have a complicated dynamic. I think at the end of the day, Rick, you know, he can't help but sort of have a fond spot for the little brat, but he yeah. still is very antagonistic towards him. And there's a lot of things that Morty's doing nowadays, especially in the main plot where Morty's kind of being this, you know, voice of dissent within Rick's life. And that's, you know, obviously not playing well for him. Which is why he's growing so close with Summer, is, you know, Summer's just embracing the lifestyle. Yeah, for a while, she, like, it's kind of like they're opposite now, like, well, Morty never really was into his adventures anyway, like, Rick just dragged him along. No, I'm glad you mentioned that, because even in the first episode, it was like, the first episode is brutal for the way that Rick just drags Morty into this terrible situation, and Morty is just doesn't want to be there the whole time, he's scared out of his mind. You know, I mean, that really sets a precedent for the show, you know what I mean? And for a long, for at least the first half of season one, that was honestly kind of the whole gimmick of the show is it's like, yeah, it's like Back to the Future, except it's an abusive Doc Brown with a Marty McFly who, like, does not want to be on this adventure. <laughs> and 
it's only I didn't in the whole in the season of, season one episode one of this season like he mentioned the whole Cronenberg war was was Rick's fault when technically it was Morty tempering with the love potion that caused well, it. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, I mean, like, did, they, like, did you forgive did you forgive Morty technically it's your fault <laughs> And obviously, I think the Cronenberg world was like the big turning point in the show's storytelling where it went from just kind of this weird offbeat back to the future parody to something else. You know what I mean? Something that like you really had to sink your teeth into with the ideas. More more existential in a way. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, that, I, I honestly think that episode is almost like a landmark of adult TV animation for what it did. You know what I mean? It really pushed the groundwork of storytelling. Oh my God. <laughs> because literally it's the whole idea is like Rick and Morty's in the entire world that we've been living in for the past five or so episodes of season one is now just done. It's gone. <laughs> I mean, if that's yeah. not a game changer, I don't know what is. <laughs> Anyways, uh, just, now we're here, season two, season three, episode two, where basically nothing of note happens. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I think you're being a little harsh. I mean, I know, I know, I know, no, no. well, nothing like that happens. Like nothing game changing happens, or nothing. Okay, well, to huge. be fair, if something like I think the Cronenberg episode is like the one time something that game changing happened. I mean, even I know. Like, even the cliffhanger ending of season two with Rick in prison, it's like we all knew Rick was going to get out of prison. You know what I mean? It's well, like, yeah, I mean, that's kind <laughs> of obvious. You know, so it's like, it, like the sh- I, I think that show. I, I think just the Cronenberg element of the show. It's. It's just the thing that kind of was like, okay, everything is expendable. Um, like, for example, based on the I, Jacob, did you get to the Jerry daycare episode in season two? I'm, oh yeah, where there's a bunch of Jerry's in that yeah, same place. Yeah, like, yeah in that, that episode, they basically like switch out the Jerry that we've been following with another Jerry, and then that's the Jerry that's on the show for the rest of the time. Because at the end of the episode, there's this mix-up, and Rick's like, "Yeah, whatever." <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, so it's like the show does stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where it's like it'll play around with those alternate dimensions, and oh god, it's it's like I said, I this episode. I mean, it, not every episode is going to be like that. I I just think the the thing that kind of creatively bankrupted this episode for me was I just did not like any of the Mad Max stuff. I just thought like. Outside of the Thunderdome stuff with the arm, that was fun, but I don't know. I yeah. like summer subplot was interesting in terms of the, you know, in terms of like how she's dealing with things and her interactions with Rick. Uh I didn't really care for the love interest thing with the hemorrhage guy, the buckethead guy. I don't know. I think that's his name, like hemorrhage or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> something dumb. <laughs> I didn't really care for that subplot. I like how they kind of uh dovetailed in to make it about divorce yet again and rick and morty are so fed up after two weeks like oh god oh god let's just get back to the real world so we can you know like deal with this slightly more stable divorce situation <laughs> and it, it was like okay you proved your point rick let's just get out of here <laughs> Um, I love the realistic bit kind of towards the end of the episode where Summer's coming home from work and the neighbors are like, you know, they're being like really polite, but then they work in like, oh, by the way, scrap metal goes in the blue bin. Summer's like, yeah, got it. And they're like, man, she's a piece of work. It's like, I totally lived with that. Like that is such a realistic depiction of how neighbors treat each other. I really appreciated that. It was such a throwaway thing, but I I just liked it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, let's and, see. How, yeah. and and basically at the end how Rick screws over the civilization yet again. <laughs> yep, yep. And, and I love I love that cut too, where you know it's like okay, two weeks later, yeah, the the entire civilization is like completely reworked itself. You know, it's like all it takes is two weeks with Rick, and they've got power. They've got you know, it, it's basically a normal society instead of a post apocalyptic society. And then but then Rick, Rick takes the power, and it's like all for naught. <laughs> yeah. He probably did. He probably planned that all along. Probably, probably. <laughs> I like some kind of, probably got some kind of sick pleasure out of it. <laughs> well, I feel like Rick is in a lot of ways kind of like 
a more sadistic version of someone like Rocket Raccoon, where Rocket Raccoon kind of has this ongoing thing where he finds it hilarious, like the whole missing body parts thing. Like, you're like, oh, take that guy's fake leg because he'll wake up and he'll realize he doesn't have it. Rick thinks like that, except on a planet, except on like a global level. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if I just completely screwed over this entire race of people or even this entire dimension of reality? <laughs> yeah, that's oh, pretty much show. what he does. He pretty much does that on a regular basis. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see. What do you think of the nonchalant robots? I know I kind of briefly mentioned them. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the whole, like, in the whole dice game and, like, and when Robot Morty started to show the fish. That was awesome. That was that was another one of my best. I think all the stuff with Morty, both in robot form and with the arm, are the best parts of the episode for me. <laughs> I want to be free, Mother. I want to hug you. I want to say I love you and have it not just be words. I want to eat ice cream and really taste it, not just have it slide down my mouth. I want to go frolic through the fields. <laughs> Yeah, and then he powers down, and he, it just—I love how it re reverts back to hello. <laughs> and Beth is none the wiser. <laughs> oh god, it just you know, just uh, kind of like when Rick powers down the both of them, and their heads just fall into the spaghetti. Like that's kind of the sort of like dark, you know, darkly comedic imagery that this show is really good at. You know, like oh jeez. My sister just died, died in the spaghetti. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, the one, and the one other thing I want to touch on that it didn't get a lot of screen time, but I really liked it, is the Jerry subplot. Oh, yeah. At the very end. Oh, my God. The, the very ending is just, it's so pathetic, but it's just, oh, my God. It's so well-timed. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like Jerry is just so meek. He's just like, "Are you sure?" Like you know, it's like he's got the he's got the uh, unemployment check and then also a bag of potato chips. And he's like, "Why would you want the piece of paper that only benefits me when you could have real food?" And I love how the dog just growls and like that's enough for Jerry. You know, like Jerry just caved in instantly. He's like, "Oh geez, okay." It's like, how like a wolf, is like that. <laughs> no for something. I don't know. But, but, um, but yeah. And then he just coughs it back. Then the wolf just the dog just coughs it back up. <laughs> I do have a theory with the Jerry stuff that's going on though, because you hear the you hear the loser whisper. And I think that's building yeah. towards something. I think that's building towards something. Because we've Unless seen like what? Is that unless it doesn't appear in any future episodes. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's very possible, Jacob. It is very possible that it's just kind of like a funny sort of like manif manifestation of the self-doubt that Cherry's experiencing, absolutely. But uh, is that even he's so pathetic, even the wind hates him. <laughs> right, right, right. But my theory, though, Jacob, is that now we've seen in the trailer for season three that there's going to be an evil sort of like alternate dimension, like glowy version of Rick and Morty. And we see them kind of like causing havoc throughout this reality. And I'm thinking that the person who is whispering loser to Jerry is the alternate dimension version of Rick. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, all Rick's hit all Jerry's. <laughs> because I could just imagine like, like the whole season we're building up like this alternate evil dimension version of Rick is like some sort of like powerhouse who's going to come in and just destroy the whole multiverse. And then in reality, this evil version of Rick just wants to troll Jerry. Like, that's just his whole <laughs> mission is just to troll Jerry. <laughs> yeah, because honestly, the whole evil, not evil thing is kind of black and white at this point. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, yeah, especially for a character like Rick Sanchez, for sure. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like, like what is good? What is, it's like, there's, there's good, and then there's Rick. <laughs> right, the good, the bad, and the Rick. Yeah. Is that been an episode title yet? Because if not, I feel like that needs to be an episode title. <laughs> sure has, but it's just surprising because almost half the titles have the word Rick. I know. <laughs> Surprisingly, I don't think any titles have any episode titles have the word have Morty in it. <laughs> well, no, but I mean the you know it's it's the it's the Rick thing, so that that's kind of the running gag. 
Um, yep. No, the good, the bad, anyway. and the Rick has not been used yet, and I'm very surprised. I, I really want to see that now. <laughs> okay. You know, so, use it. Royal and Harmon, use it. <laughs> <laughs> because it fits Rick's character so well. You know what I mean? It's almost like the good and the bad. You know, anyways. You know what I mean. Like he's good and bad, and he's Rick. <laughs> mm -hmm. all... Okay, All so right, go ahead. yeah, it's fine. So next week, Jacob, we have got an epic episode coming up. Something that is legendary. Something that everyone has speculated about ever since they saw it in the, uh, I believe it was a Super Bowl trailer or something like that. Uh, we saw this image a while ago. I'm Pickle Rick. Oh Whoa, yeah. Oh, I'm a pickle. Oh yeah, I've been. I, 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 I've been <laughs> so next week is Pickle Rick, which I I am stoked for, because uh, one of my fa my favorite episode of the series is Me Seeks and Destroy the Mister Me Seeks episode. I think that episode is just perfection. Aren't there, uh, two, aren't there two Me Seeks episodes? No, there's just the one. Mister oh, Me Seeks okay. is a character that like needs to return. This one, uh, this one there was two. But never mind. <laughs> Mr. Meeseeks makes a cameo, but he doesn't have an, an episode. All right. Yeah, he makes a cameo in Blitz and Chips in the in the uh, Jerry Day Daycare episode. Uh, let me see. All right. All right. Jacob, have you seen the Tiny Rick episode from season two? I don't recall that one. Whoa, look out. It's Tiny Rick. Uh, Jacob, I would very much recommend watching at least that episode before Pickle Rick comes on. I have no idea if they're going to be similar at all, but just the whole conceit of like Tiny Rick is Rick, you know, turns himself into like a, a person, like a tiny person to assimilate into high school to basically go on like an undercover mission. Uh, and <laughs> with Pickle Rick, he's obviously doing some sort of mission, but he's turned himself into a pickle. So I'm. I have a feeling that Pickle Rick is going to be kind of like a spiritual successor to Tiny Rick in a lot of ways. Um, I don't. Hold on. Let me get the name of that episode for you. I know it's not just Tiny Rick. Um, let me see. I I want to. Oh, it's a uh, Big Trouble in Little Sanchez. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that one. I don't think. Yeah, you definitely check that one out before next week. All right. Um, any final thoughts, Jacob? <laughs> No, I, other than I look forward to what season, season three has to offer. I mean, I haven't really been following a lot of promotion stuff, but yeah, still, I do. I do look. I do like this show, and I can't wait to see how it goes forward. It, I, I like that this show is not like other Cartoon Network shows, where it's like, okay, we're just going to give you like five episodes and take three months off. You know, this show, it's like, no, we're not going to fuck around with that. We're going to give you one episode a week, like a normal damn TV show. <laughs> so I kind of appreciate that in the midst of like the whole like Star vs. the Force of Evil releasing eight episodes at once or Welcome to the Wayne releasing five episodes within the course of a week, you know. <laughs> well, with Wayne, we don't know if they're like releasing it more anytime soon, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they don't like release episode release dates until like a week before their air. <laughs> and that's that's kind of my point though. It's nice that with Rick and Morty we've got like at least the next four or so weeks on the wiki. You know, it's like it's it's set. Like the then the next three or four weeks we're good to go with new episodes. I don't know if they're gonna take a hiatus. I hope not, but you know, we'll see. This is up this hiatus isn't it, for another year and a half. <laughs> for like a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the revival of Tiki's Universe. Tiki's Universe is more or less going to be the focus of the channel for all intents and purposes. I mean, we're going to do other stuff as well. Like, we're still going to do movie reviews, TV show recaps, Our you game know, shows. movie commentary, game shows. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, Tiki's Universe is definitely like, there, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline. So. <laughs> The crown jewel. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All right. Okay, guys. So see you guys later.